Good evening, everyone. I'm Marianne Richter, director of the Columbus Museum. I can't tell you how happy I am to have people here in person for this event. It's so exciting after all the times that we've been um, doing things remotely. So welcome, welcome. I'm so happy you're here for the Columbus Museum's Rothschild Distinguished Speaker Roundtable Discussion, Direct Action in the Chattahoochee Valley, which is moderated by Rashida Ali. In a moment, um, Lucy Kassir, the museum's director of education and engagement, will introduce our speakers, all of whom will share their firsthand experience as youth leaders in the local civil rights movement. We are excited to resume the Rothschild Distinguished Speaker Series and meet in person for this program. The Rothschild Distinguished Speaker Series is made possible by the Aileen and Irwin Rothschild Endowment Fund, a 1998 bequest of the late Norman Rothschild in his parents' memory. We are thankful for this wonderful bequest and to the Rothschild family for their continued support of educational programs at the Columbus Museum. The exhibition that is related to our roundtable discussion, Journey Towards Justice, the Civil Rights Movement in the Chattahoochee Valley, is on view in the Legacy Gallery. We are grateful to the 25-member advisory panel that met over many months to shape and guide its content and share their expertise and lived experiences. We are also grateful to AFLAC for generously sponsoring and making possible Journey Towards Justice, the Civil Rights Movement in the Chattahoochee Valley. Before I um, turn this over to my colleague, Rebecca Bush, Curator of History, who will give you a brief timeline, um, I wanted to also welcome um, a, one or two distinguished guests in particular. Our mayor, Skip Henderson, is here this evening. So we're excited about that. And I don't, and, and his lovely wife, and I don't know if he's arrived yet, but United States Representative Sanford Bishop is on his way as well to attend, so we're very pleased. Lastly, I want to mention a little advertisement for a major exhibition coming this summer, opening on July 1st. If you um, know the work of Alma Thomas, she was an uh, artist who grew up in Columbus. We have a landmark major traveling exhibition we co-organized that will be here July 1 through September 25th. You can learn more about this incredibly talented uh, American artist who also happened to be the first African-American woman to get a solo exhibition at the Whitney Museum. And so this is something wonderful to look forward to. And we have some information cards you can collect on your way out of, of this auditorium. And with that, I will introduce Rebecca Bush, curator of history and the curator for the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne, and thank you to everyone for coming tonight. I echo her enthusiasm. It is so wonderful to have live programs again. Um, so this morning we did a roundtable discussion live stream for um, several MCSD students as well as some private school students. And it struck us as our panelists tonight were speaking with such rich lived experience and such deep familiarity with their own stories and the actions that they lived um, that if you have not lived these events or uh, spent an hour or two studying the exhibit upstairs, um, you might be a little lost as to the timeline of what happened when and who some of these uh, important people were. So I'm just gonna give a brief overview that hopefully provides a better grounding for the discussion you're about to hear. In 1929, several black medical professionals and other businessmen established the Social Civic 25 Club in Columbus. This organization offered networking and service opportunities. Many of the club's members, such as Dr. Thomas Brewer and real estate developer E.E. E. Farley, became leaders in Columbus's earliest civil rights efforts. The club itself provided the foundation of the city's NAACP chapter in 1939. World War II brought more future leaders of Columbus's black community, such as A.J. McClung and Gordon Kitchen, through their work at the city's African American USO and YMCA. Many iconic mom moments of the civil rights movement involved nonviolent direct action. Columbus activists used direct action to protest segregation in many settings, led first by Dr. Thomas Brewer. In 1944, Brewer worked with black minister Primus King on a lawsuit that became the first step in restoring African-American voting rights. 
Brewer later advocated for the hiring of black police officers and the integration of public schools, parks, and golf courses with mixed success. From 1961 to 1963, a flurry of protests by high school and college students spurred the integration of buses, businesses, and public parks and libraries. John Townsend, a Spencer High graduate, became the first non-white student to attend Columbus College in 1963. Public school integration began slowly in 1964, and in 1965, Albert Thompson became the city's first black elected official since Reconstruction. Columbus's first African-American city councilors, A.J. McClung and Dr. Robert Wright, were elected in 1970, followed by the first black woman city councilor, Rose Strong, in 1984. Despite successes, violence also marred this time. In 1948, crosses were burned into the lawns of black civic leaders Elizabeth Lunsford and F.R. Lampkin. The assassination of Thomas Brewer in 1956 and the lack of legal consequences for his killer led many African-American professionals to leave the city. In 1957, Clarence Pickett, a black minister, was brutally beaten by a white police officer at the city jail. Pickett died two days later after his injuries were brushed off by an intern at the medical center. Though the FBI briefly investigated the case, an all-white jury found the officer not guilty. On July 1, 1958, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke to a large audience at the Prince Hall Masonic Lodge, while armed guards stood watch on the roof. That same night, white supremacists bombed the home of Essie Mae Ellison, a black woman who had bought a house in a white neighborhood. African-American teenagers who tried to integrate Lake Bottom Park in 1963 were met with rocks thrown by white youths. The most notable event in Columbus's civil rights movement came in the summer of 1971 when seven black police officers were fired for protesting working conditions within the department. This action sparked more than two months of turmoil, including marches, fire bombings, curfews, and arrest. National news coverage swelled until late July when the New York Times described the city as, quote, on the brink of schizophrenia. That is a very brief and incomplete overview of the timeline of some of the events that are going to be discussed tonight. Um, I encourage you to visit the exhibit upstairs and um, to learn more. The people on this stage tonight played various roles in direct action protest. Here to introduce them now is Lucy Kassir, the museum's director of education and engagement. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, we are really honored to have this uh, panel of speakers that we have today. Um, they are really just fantastic people for, uh, that we can all learn from. And so I'm going to introduce them to you. So on the far right, we have our moderator, Ms. Rashida Ali, who is a 1965 graduate of Spencer High School and attended Tuskegee University. After a 40-year radio career in New York and Georgia, she, reti she retired in her hometown of Columbus, but went back to work after 10 years. <laughs> Ali returned to radio and can be heard in the midday on 95.3 Smooth R&B. Ali serves her community through organizing and volunteer work with the New Georgia Project, Columbus NAACP, Working Families Party, and her most recent endeavor, Grannies on Guard. <laughs> To the left of Rashida is Lillian Bunky McClung Clark. Hi. <laughs> who was born in Birmingham and raised in Columbus and is the daughter of the late A.J. McClung, a civic leader and the first mayor pro tem of Columbus. She graduated from Spencer High in 1959 and later graduated from George Williams College in Chicago. While living in Atlanta, she worked for the Atlanta Urban League and she also served in President Jimmy Carter's administration. She now resides in Los Angeles. In the middle of the stage, we have the Reverend Rudy Allen Sr., who was born and raised in Columbus. He graduated from Spencer High in 1954 and is a graduate of the American Baptist Theological Seminary in Nashville. He is the past president and treasurer of the Columbus Phoenix City Ministerial Alliance, a charter member and one of the founders of the Metro Columbus Urban League, 
a member of the Columbus Phoenix City Baptist Ministers Conference, a member of the executive board of the, of the General Missionary Baptist Convention of Georgia, past dean of the Mount Calvary Congress of Christian Education, treasurer of Mount Calvary Baptist Association, and a life member of the NAACP. He is the former pastor of Macedonia Baptist Church and Greater Shady Grove Baptist Church, both of Columbus, Georgia. In November 1980, Reverend Allen founded Revelation Missionary Baptist Church, where he served as senior pastor until his retirement in December 2004. All right. Next, we have Ethelyn Kirby. Ethelyn Kirby grew up in Columbus as the daughter of civil rights activist Minnie Wimbish. She graduated from Spencer High in 1960 and later earned a degree from Seattle University. As a student at Columbus College in 1972, she helped organize the first citywide interracial Christian youth rally. She worked as an assistant film librarian for an advertising agency in New York before returning to Columbus and becoming involved in religious and civic activities. And all the way to the left, we have Mr. Ibrahim Moomin. Ibrahim graduated from Spencer High in 1965 as Charlie Porter, later attending Howard University. He has also completed leadership training at Harvard University. For several decades, he has been the president of Moomin and Associates LLC, a community economic development firm in Washington, DC. He is a member of Leadership Washington, was the first Muslim chair of the Interfaith National Conference for Community and Justice, and in 2003 was invited to unveil a statue of Nelson Mandela at the South African Embassy after being arrested for protesting Man Mandela's imprison oh, tongue -tied. imprisonment in 1985. <laughs> and with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Ali. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Lucy. And welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I am your moderator for tonight. And we're not going to get mad, even though you're going to want to be mad. Some things happen that are going to make you mad. And these people right here, they're on fire, so just be ready. <laughs> so we're just going to, it's a roundtable discussion. I have questions, and later tonight, if I'm correct, uh, you have filled out your cards, and your questions will be asked. But right now, I have some questions uh, that uh, I want to throw out here to the panel. And it's a discussion. So we'll just start out with, um, tell us about organizing and planning the process and how those uh, actions went down. Reverend Allen, you want to kick it off since you're the elder here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I started uh, participating in the Civil Rights Movement in Nashville, uh, urged by John Lewis to participate in the sit-in. And I did that for the, the winter of 80, I'm sorry, winter of 61. And uh, in uh, 62, I came, I, I came to Columbus to get something started here. I think that's very important the way I phrase that because nothing recently had been done here in Columbus. And I discovered that the bus, someone had gone to the, the city council and asked for them to integrate the buses and they said no, but, or they were taken under advisement. So I gathered several college students and we decided to ride the bus in a desegregated manner, uh, which most of them were jailed on the first day. I was not jailed on the first ride because the, guy, the detective that came to, up to me came straight to me. I don't know who told him, but he came straight to me and said, you're the reason for this mess. But the other kids were, were arrested. I got arrested the second time we rode. And after the second time we rode, things began to click. Uh, Roy Martin, who owned the bus line at the time, decided to integrate the buses. He also, we also got the downtown lunch counter uh, places like Woolworth, Crest, uh, Silvers, uh, those, those places. 
they also agreed to, to desegregate the lunch counters. And then Roy Martin again decided that he would desegregate the, the, uh, the, uh, the theaters. So basically that, that's my uh, participation in, in the movement in Columbus, but it was just, it was more than that because the police, I was involved with the police, I was involved with raid laundry workers, I was involved with the Harvey Lumber Company workers, and uh, there were several other things that happened in Columbus that I uh, was involved in. But I'm thankful that uh, I was able to do that because uh, I wanted my children to be able to reach their fullest potential and one way I felt that they could reach their fullest potential was for me to do everything I could do to, to be sure that they did. Okay. And you know, um, Rudy is being a little shy. Oh, you can't hear me with this on? <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Rudy's being a little shy about some of the work that he did. As he speaks, uh, I think a lot of you might have remembered some of these things, but we've got some newer uh, visitors from Columbus who had an interest in coming, and we're really happy. So happy to see all of you. I am really happy. But he was our leader. I was a little know-it-all freshman coming out of Chicago, and uh, I came back to Columbus having heard that some of... Uh, uh, the people that I knew uh, up in Tennessee was really hot. And I think a lot of people didn't realize that a lot of stuff was going on. I mean, John had been beaten and arrested a lot of times up there. And uh, Rudy uh, failed to talk about, he was up there in seminary. And so I don't know uh, if uh, you experienced any of those uh, beatings or anything, but certainly the activity that was going on was enough to make you want to come home and make some changes. And, uh, and he knew that he could get some folks uh, in Columbus. Uh, students were ready. We had enough information from other, uh, uh, well, they weren't historically black schools then, but they were some black schools that, that students were being in, uh, having some kind of uh, action. I mean, they were getting arrested in Atlanta for trying to integrate riches, uh, one after another after another, filling the jails. So Rudy came to Columbus, and he put out the call. And like I said, a whole bunch of young folks like me turned up. We, I mentioned earlier that there were boys and girls at this time. And uh, I'm, uh, Rudy's older than me, I'm 80, but I can't remember all the names of some of the, the girls I do. But I can't remember the guys who were there. And Rudy and I sat this morning trying to reminisce. And, and I think his history is just about like mine. Uh, but, uh, but we understood what we wanted to do in our hometown. Let me add some of the names. Um, you had Mary Ogletree, who's now living in Texas. Uh, we had something here called Pick and Hatch and Loan and you could borrow money to go to college there if he was going to go in the state of Georgia. So as soon as Pick and Hatchet found out that Mary was a part of the movement, they took her along. And her life was kind of hurt after that. And, um, but she still had a very successful life. I just talked with her even today. You had Elaine Green from Hampton, uh, University. You had Vivian Warren from Fisk. Uh, there was Gladys Lane. I, I don't know where Gladys might be now. But um, I happened to be in on the last of the telling end of the committee when they were planning the night before getting ready to catch the bus or to be a part of the bus movement. My mother was extremely glad I didn't go to jail that time. Um, but later, I'd become involved with the black policemen in their movement, and we stayed in jail for a week. And uh, many of you do not know, but there was a man by the name of Claude Austin. He owned the snack bar. And Claude sent us dinners every day. I never known this to happen in a way, but we got some good food <laughs> in that jail. <laughs> and it, uh, Claude made sure that we did do that. 
I see my time is up, but I sure do hate it. <laughs> Go ahead. Rashida, thank you for that question. Many of you know that I have a policy of starting off by acknowledging those people who were with us in 1963 who are no longer here, particularly I think about William Crawford, who we call Tutu. Mm -hmm. Some of you yeah. who went to Carver High School know that he was a great football player. And so that was very important. I, I got involved, in fact, my older brother, Jake, who's sitting down here, kind of uh, set me up. You know, we, we were going to a meeting because he had met the field secretaries from the Youth Council of NAACP at that, I was going to say hotel, but motel, mm -hmm. Rigdon Road, I think it was called, uh, near Carver. The Carver, Carver Motel. Carver Motel. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he had met the field secretary, so he was excited, and so he came, he said, hey, I want you to come to this meeting with me, and I was ready because, uh, as I've said to uh, the students early this morning, I was in the 10th grade, and I'd had a wonderful teacher named Ethlyn Coleman, uh, who uh, made us uh, memorize portions of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and we had to stand up and recite at, at different times, and so we, we did that. And it didn't take me very long to figure out that there was a contradiction. It was hypocritical between what was being taught in those founding documents and what we were seeing here in Columbus, Georgia. And so I was ready, you know, uh, to do something. So we went to the meetings at the Carver Motel. They had workshops on how to handle yourself in a demonstration. And they had chosen the Bradley Library to do the first demonstration because they didn't want to do what, what, what happened in Albany earlier where they were scattered all over the place. But in Columbus, there was a focus thing in 63 on the Bradley Library that was all white and, and blacks could not go there. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, look, tell our audience, and we are Zooming right now, everyone. Mm -hmm. So we are around the world right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay. How did your youth influence your decision to become involved? And as you discuss that, what did you learn as a result of your participation? So as a youth, how did it influence you to become involved and what did you learn from it? You want me to st Go I'll, ahead. I'll start if I can. I think one of the things about being young is that uh, I see many of my family members here. My mother, Viola Porter and Jake Porter Sr. They, were, uh, they didn't have very much formal education, but they were passionate about making us get education. I remember my father used to have uh, encyclopedias, and they were in a glass case, and, and you had to wash your hands before you handled yeah. encyclopedias. You, know, you couldn't just go pick them up. But as, as a result, as I was saying earlier, of learning things in school, I, I, I felt I had more information and more knowledge than they had, and so I was you know, obligated to try and do something. Now, in fairness, uh, my parents didn't know what we were doing. Jake and I didn't tell them, you know, because we knew that the answer would have been no, because they were, they felt very strong. My mother was a strong black woman, my father was strong too, but they were afraid. And they were afraid because of this, this trauma here in Columbus, Georgia. Many people don't know. In fact, I, I don't believe the civil rights st struggle started in 1920. Yesterday when I came here, Carol and I went to 11th and Broadway where we, we took time to say a prayer for Slater and Slayton and Miles, two black men who were lynched in 1896 on that mm -hmm. corner there. And not only were they lynched, they were riddled with bullets and their bodies sat there for days before they were taken down with some crazy slogan over there. So that was the atmosphere here. It, it was a, a, a atmosphere of fear. But I felt that I had more to, to gain and I was, my next door neighbor, James C. Hunter, Dan knows him, he, uh, they were relatives, was showing me the Jet magazine. Anybody remember Jet magazines? Yep. <laughs> and we would see the pictures. I saw Emmett Till and all the other people, Medgar Evers, and what was happening uh, in, in Birmingham and Montgomery and in Mississippi and Albany and all over. And I said, we have the same things here and it's, it's time for a change. What about your, your childhood, Ms. Kirby? Um, right after leaving West Virginia State University, um, I um, got me a, went in the world and got me a PhD in streetology, churchology, folksology, earthology, and peopleology. And then I returned home and everything with the churches was still the same. 
They, there was no, even with Dr. King coming here, they, uh, they were afraid to even bring them to the church. The, the Masons, Mr. Nesby was very instrumental in doing that. He had connection at Dexter Avenue in Montgomery and the Prince Hall Masons brought him here. But I was very concerned about how the churches, they were, they, they collectively, they were just sleeping. And so Mayor Allen was extremely helpful in helping me to start this youth movement. As a matter of fact, he made sure we got the municipal auditorium then, it was now in South Common. And uh, we had support from Fort Benning, Cassandra Stanback Reynolds, uh, the late Cassandra Stanback Reynolds was a part, she was a student at uh, Columbus State University. And uh, so that was um, important to me because Dr. King was so, 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 so cooked up on the churches doing what they should be doing. And uh, when I look at the black movement, I see, I mean, you just cannot deny the power of prayer. And what God had done for us is a people. And how it brought us from the back of the bus to the driver's seat from years of systematic brainwash manipulations from houses we built not to comfort that we now know. And I could not understand why the churches, was, I had good support from St. Luke, from the Episcopal Church, from St. Mark. And uh, it was, and, and from white uh, uh, students at St. Mark and uh, St. Luke, and uh, it was just a successful movement. And even Mayor Allen also had the ministers to come over and to be a part of it. I sure hate my time is up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There's more for you to tell us. There's more. Um, well, Bonky, can you tell us what you learned from your participation? What did you learn from it? Well, I think that it was interesting that uh, I was a follower. Uh, when you have a good leader, and you have someone who builds um, some respect, uh, you're gonna get uh, people who are willing to follow. So I was one of those who felt that uh, what, what uh, Rudy was doing was something that uh, I wanted to get involved with. I was ready for something anyway. Uh, I think, uh, during that time, a lot of, of black students, and, and, and we were Negro students, I uh, was corrected earlier this morning, that uh, uh, things were happening. And, and, and who was it? Uh, Evelyn, was it you that mentioned Jet Magazine? Who was that? Mm -hmm. That was April. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jet Magazine uh, was really like our newspaper. Everybody, uh, and people are still reading Jet. Um, and, uh, and also the other uh, black papers coming out of Atlanta. Things were happening. Columbus was unique. I think Fort Benning was there, but there was a lot of Jim Crow, a lot of meanness, and there was a lot of fear here. But I learned that um, something could be done. Um, okay, yeah. Thank you. Reverend Allen. Yeah, I moved to Illinois in 1956. And I discovered that the same things that were happening here in Columbus were also happening in the North. I was refused service in restaurants. I was uh, refused uh, a service in, in, in other areas. And uh, I just found out that it was practically no different. So when I went to seminary, I met with John Lewis and Bevel and those guys Say the full name, so huh? say Bevel's full name. James so, Bevel, yeah. uh, Bernard Lafayette. Um, and uh, they really influenced me uh, to, to get involved. And I had uh, one child. I, I guess I, I'm, still the senior, I'm still the senior citizen uh, <laughs> in the group, and I was the senior citizen in terms of my participation <laughs> in the movement. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, I learned that things were, were, were the same, and I discovered then that somebody needed to do something here in Columbus, and that somebody was me. Let me add to that um, what Rudy just said about things being the same in the northern states, because I was a part of that boycott in A&S department store in New York, and you could not work up front if you were not high yellow. That's just the way it was. And I, would, and, and I had the opportunity to have dinner at the home of Stokely Carmichael and Ralph Brown was there, so it was a different kind of a group. 
But I heard Dr. King say this, and, and it hit me very strongly. He said that the man in the South can't vote, and the one in the North didn't have nothing to vote for. <laughs> you know, see, he, I happen to have heard that, and so I could agree that you had this going on all the People in the North thought they had it going on. We but, thought but, it. Yeah, we thought they but they, they, yeah. Had, they had their problems, too. So <laughs> what can others learn from this history? Brother Ibrahim. Well, I, I think... The, I think one of the biggest challenges, in fact, I, my, uh, I, I certainly want to give uh, kudos to uh, the museum here for sponsoring this exhibit. You know, Rashida, because you were involved with this. In 2015, I came here to the 50th uh, reunion for Spencer High School, class of 65. And one of the trips was coming here to this museum, and I asked the, the lady, the docent there, who was guiding us to see the a civil rights exhibit, and she told me, we didn't have those kind of problems here in Columbus. Yeah. And I looked her straight in the eye and said, Miss, I got locked up here in 1963 uh, <laughs> trying to go to an all-white library. You had problems like that here, and I just walked out. And I, I remember getting on the bus and telling Rashida, we got to do something about that. And so I'm glad that finally, some years yeah. later, <laughs> uh, things are, are, are happening. And, and I think what we have to do is, uh, many of you know Carter G. Woodson, people know Carter G. Woodson, the one who started Negro History Week and now Black History Month. What he said is that he was doing, starting Negro History Week well, because so much of the history of black people had left, been left out of the history of, of America, including Georgia. So you shouldn't have to have white history and black history, there should be history. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And so my, my hope is that because of things like this, people will begin to recognize some important events that take place. You know, uh, again, I talked about what happened at, in, in the Lynch in 1896. There should be a marker in front of that building that was called the Bradley Library. There were some other significant uh -huh. things that took place here in, 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 in Georgia. I remember uh, the, the problem with uh, going to Hopewell Baptist Church, where we went to church in Eupatoa, Georgia. And on the left-hand side, some of you who are older like me remember, there was a Ku Klux Klan place out mm -hmm. there. That was mm -hmm. part of the history. So you, it's got to be the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. You can't just mm -hmm. tell the part that you like, that you think is sweet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, for those who can't figure it out, these elders now in their 80s, mid-80s, if I may say so about uh, <laughs> Reverend Allen, he was 24. <laughs> Didn't you say you were 24 when, when the bus boycott happened, when you got involved? Ms. Kirby, around the same in her 20s. Bunky, you were in your 20s, early 20s. Mm -hmm. Ibrahim was 15, mm -hmm. wow. and, and I was 15. Yeah. So what is something you wish your younger self had known? Let me answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I mean, we missed, I missed a lot from not talking to some of the elders and listening to their stories. It, mm -hmm. it was just an honor one day for me to sit in the backyard of, uh, at a, a Mrs. Uh, Lunsford and to hear what she had to say. Um, it, I, that's just, you know, and when they're gone, you cannot pull that back. And, and this is, 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 is a frame of references. It's so important. If you don't hear the stories, if you don't know the struggle, if you can't feel the pains, you, you, you know, you miss so much of who you are as a person. So I deeply wish that I had heard more of their stories. And even down, my mother said to me one, one morning about 3 o'clock, she said, baby, so you mind if mama sang to you a little of her blues? Ooh. I got that microphone, I mean, the tape recorder, and I mean, and it just sounds good. It's better than all rap songs put together today. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a story behind what they had to say. Mm -hmm. So I think that we missed a whole lot by not embracing uh, their conversations and their struggles and their pains and their hurts and their disappointments and their desire to see that we had a better day. Mm -hmm. Reverend Allen, do you have uh, memories of your younger self? What would you say? <laughs> I have one. I, I, I think I uh, related that earlier today that really struck me when I was uh, about seven or eight years old, maybe nine. I lived on the corner of Fifth Street and Second Avenue, and across from me was a white family. 
that lived on the other corner. And uh, had two children over there. One was a boy, his name was Billy, and the other was a girl, her name was Gloria. Well, Billy and I and Gloria played together, I mean, almost every day. But one particular day, I yelled over there, Billy, come on over, let's play. He didn't say anything at first. Yes, he did. He said, I can't. I said, what do you mean you can't? Come on over. I can't. I said, well, I'll come over there. He said, you can't. I said, why can't I come over there? He said, because my daddy said, you, we can't play with y'all. And that struck a note with me. And from that point, even at a, as a kid, eight, nine years old, I knew within me that I had to do something to make this place a better place for our people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And, Thank and, you. and that, it didn't matter what it was. If it meant going to jail, if it meant getting hurt, getting killed, I knew I had to do something to make this place better for yeah. my people. If, if, well. if, if, if I can, Rashida, I, I felt similar. I think I was very happy when we talked with our, the students uh, this morning, and th uh, they were asking, you know, you know, were we were we afraid? And I said, I, I had a concern, obviously, because I, I knew from reading the Columbus Inquirer as well as Jed and other uh, periodicals that people were being hurt and killed all over, and so there was a risk here that this could happen. But That's I said. Right. I, I was prepared to, to go for it because, you know, I, I had, again, as Frederick Douglass say, it's a danger to teach a slave how to read because mm -hmm. not only did I read, write, and count, I started to think critically. And again, I was mm -hmm. saying earlier, the, the contradictions between what I was being forced to learn and memorize mm -hmm. and what I saw here on the ground in Columbus. In fact, I, I'm glad to see my brother-in-law, Dan Dolman, here tonight. I think I mentioned him once before when I was here. You know, he had served in the Air Force, you know, uh, my father served in the army in World War II. I, I see my cousins over here, their father served in the World War II. Uh, and they came back and couldn't go to the Bradley Library to get a car to check out a book. But some white soldiers at Fort Benning who were there for training, who had fought America in World War II, they could go to the library and get out a book. That, that's jacked up. That, that made no sense to me that here we were, you know, First-class citizens. American d yeah. doesn't have untouchables or different classes of citizenship. You're a citizen or you're not a citizen. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and the first thing, you'll see my quote in the exhibit downstairs when, I, when we, we used to challenge Ms. Coleman and she said, when we said, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, who is we the people? Mm -hmm. We the people did not include blacks or enslaved people, you know, when that was uh, done in 1776. And, and so the question is, what are we going to do about it? And so we have to be moving toward that more perfect union. I think Barack Obama said uh, slavery was America's original sin, and we have to do something about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I was, if I might, um, yes. I was a little bit luckier with uh, growing up in my household with my dad. Uh, we moved here from Panama City. They had sent uh, my dad down to Panama City to open up a facility for black uh, soldiers there. And uh, when uh, they began to operate the one here that uh, Lula Huff's uh, grandmother had built, that beautiful building there on Fifth Avenue, they asked uh, for Mr. Kitchen and, and A.J. McClung to come here. Um, this was the USO. This was the black USO, and there was a white USO here. But this was during the time when we were talking with the students this morning, trying to make them see that difference. Because when you're talking to young minds, and, and, and they're dealing with their world, and we're expressing our minds as an older world, you wonder how it's really, how the transition is really coming through but some of the questions let us know that they were thinking about some of these things with, with what they asked. I was lucky to be able to be a little girl when uh, some of these people would sit around in my dad's house, my mother's house, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and discuss things that were happening here in Columbus. And like you said, the So C Club, uh, that was something that was very important during that time and how it developed the NAACP was something very, very important. Well, I uh, was able to not understand things then, 
but they became clearer once uh, going, like, like Rudy said, and when I went to Chicago, and some of these same things were happening there. And uh, I think that's when I, I uh, had been called high yellow and all these things when I was in school in the black community. But when I got to Chicago, they didn't know I was black. Everybody in the South knew it. <laughs> All right, then. Um, in your eyes, well, before I ask that question, what were the success or failures of the, civ the local civil rights movement in your eyes? S success or failures? Any? Well, I think for us, out outside, I, in 63, I was very happy that miraculously, 30 days after we got arrested at the Bradley Library, the Board of Education voted to integrate the libraries. And of course, they said the demonstrations had nothing to do with that, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we were happy about that, although it was a kind of convoluted system that they had. But there was still a lot of work uh, to be done. I think, to me, one of the missed opportunities uh, in, in what we were doing in 63 is that all of the people who were involved with our effort were black. And I think I did, I did not know any white people who had worked with us and, and, and helped out in, in Columbus. And that's a big, big missing part. And so I was very, for example, happy recently after the George Floyd killing to see blacks and whites and, all, and Asians and others participating in, in the movement. And I think uh, my sister Ethel mentioned this morning that one of the, the great tragedies is that many in the faith community have not embraced equality and justice. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a missing part because I know uh, in, in Washington, D.C., we got a church on almost every corner or a mosque or whatever. And, and all of us believe in the, the one who created the sun, moon, and stars and us. And we need to be talking about how do we come together. All of us are neighbors and God's children. Thank mm. you. Thank you. I heard, um, what's, this, Janet, what's the cold lady's name at Spelman University? Was Je Janetta. Janetta yeah. Cole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She says, education is to empower you that you might empower others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of the, we, we dropped the ball. We got so comfortable sitting in our high blood pressure seats and brain stroke positions. And we dropped the ball in passing that kind of information and that feeling in those to our, our children. And you, you can't expect something from a child if you didn't put it in them. And if they don't know their history, they're lost. So um, with all of the accomplishments, I still think there was a little disappointment in not passing that ball on to generation after mm -hmm. generation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, th I, I, th I, th I still think it's uh, uh, very important, like you said, to talk about the fact that there were uh, some accomplishments that came along. I mean, everything wasn't uh, something that was, we learned from all of that and hopefully uh, we were able to step over some of it. You can look around uh, our community now and see some of these examples. I'm looking out at the congressman there. Uh, we were talking about uh, people being able to vote. Uh, and that was earlier this morning, trying to make an impact on students. Uh, with the importance of the vote. I don't want to transition to, to voting right now. That's mm -hmm. going to be something that we need to talk about. But the fact that we have people not wanting to read and understand our history mm -hmm. and to make it sound as if there's something wrong with the fact that it makes whites feel uncomfortable and therefore uh, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be taught in school and they shouldn't read the books uh, that were available that talked about some historical things that uh, uh, black heroes and sheroes uh, were accomplished with. So uh, when you talk about dropping the ball, there are a lot of balls that have been dropped, but we also yeah. picked up some. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I think one of the failures during the the uh, civil rights movement has been the failure of adults to get involved. Mm -hmm. Most of the movements were led and executed by young people. I, I suppose the adults were afraid uh, job. for some reason, but and I, I, I guess that's, that's, I guess I would fall into that group now. I'm not a, I've never been afraid of anything, but uh, I guess when you get older, you think that comfort is more 
valuable to you than uh, raising the level of life for others. Well, well maybe that's maybe that was pro part of the problem, but that was one failure that I saw that the ducks were not involved like they should have been. But look at you. At least like I thought they Look at Ethelyn. Look at me. Look at all of us here. Those adults worked very hard to ensure us getting an education. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, the, the interest that we were at that time going off to black, predominantly black schools uh, was still the point was uh, there was a reason for that. Uh, when I graduated from Spencer, um, we applied to the University of Georgia. And uh, my daddy did it. He thought that was something that would be interesting to do. And was I willing to go there? And I was re ready and willing to do that. Well, I was rejected. But they are willing to pay to send you to another school up north mm -hmm. to get an education rather than one here. We, we mean, had some unspoken heroes, too. Yeah. People in the, in the, in the, in the village. Uh, Bellwood School up at Harrison Avenue, we had a principal by the name of Mrs. Annabelle Nelson. We had the ice cream man who used to come through and uh, sell ice cream, ring his bell. So we found out later that the ice cream man was a Ku Klux Klansman. And um, Dr. Bobby um, Truitt, he was out playing one night, and he, little Bobby then, and he knew the ice cream man because he had his left arm was arm, hand was cut off. And uh, so he went back and told Miss Nelson that the ice cream man was uh, with the Klansman and he saw left it. So Miss Annabelle had us to boycott the ice cream man. Mm -hmm. I never known little children to boycott the ice cream man. <laughs> but we did it. Yeah. So, uh, and eventually we put left it out of the business. <laughs> you know, I sure wanted his ice cream, but he couldn't sell no ice cream in Bellwood. Mm -hmm. So we, 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 we had heroes there who, who their names, it was so many other people behind the scene who did whatever they could to do in their own way. And they left their marks. We would never forget them. Never, never, never. There, there, there has always been a group yeah. in the community of adults. I was not talking about the group. Mm -hmm. I was talking about the community as a whole. Oh, you got you, we got you. That, uh, the adults, I don't remember, maybe in Montgomery, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but uh, we didn't get the, the total participation. You never get the total, I don't suppose, but we didn't get the kind of participation, as I said earlier, that I thought we should have had from mm -hmm. the You're right, you're right yeah. on that. There are a lot of panel members here tonight, and uh, serving on the panel was an honor for me. I re remember when we first started, we were talking about how far back would we go to talk about the civil rights movement in Columbus. And it came out that, well, uh, are we going to go back to 1865? Because the movement could have started then. And mm -hmm. then how far in the future? So my question, mm -hmm. in your eyes, is the civil rights movement still going on now? Definitely. Of course, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, I certainly take issue with many of the academics, particularly who, who want to say the civil rights movement stopped in the 60s or something. And I think, uh, as I shared with our, our high school students this morning, God has blessed me to be able to continue work in civil rights and social justice even after I left Columbus, Georgia. And I, and I mentioned earlier, my mother and father, they were happy when I left because they figured I was going to be in jail a lot of time here in Georgia. <laughs> Uh, and I ended up spending some jail in some other places, but that's all right. It, it was a continuum. But the, I, I think the, 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 I was not looking to get locked up. I was working on issues that were important uh, to me. And as my colleagues have said, you, you know, uh, there was a wonderful quote by Martin King that said, somebody asked me, why did I get involved with the South African movement? I said, he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so... When, when you had 10% of the people in South Africa controlling 90% you know, of the wealth and blacks couldn't even vote, that was an issue. So we, we you know, had some demonstrations. I got locked up in 85. Worked, I've been currently uh, working for DC statehood. 
you know, because it's unfair mm -hmm. that we have 700,000 people who live in the nation's capital. Yeah. We pay more federal taxes than three states, but we can't vote. We don't have a senator or a representative, and I'm glad that the congressman is here uh, from, uh, from Columbus. You know, but that's very important. And, 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 and I said, and I continue to say, I'm proud of what Columbus did in the last election because you sent us two senators, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the uh, seeing young people like my nieces here is very important. We've got to have dialogue with them right. because we have to accept some responsibility for passing a legacy on. My, my son has a quote that says, uh, Dad, many times we're like a, a football team that's losing the game with the best player sitting on the bench. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it may not be somebody with gray hair or whatever, but we got we to gotta end it. Sorry, my time's up. <laughs> Anyone else? Mm -hmm. One more question? Excuse me. <laughs> as, as we are finishing this last question, if you have a note card and you have a, a question you'd like to write down for our panel members, please do so, and myself or one of my colleagues will come up and down the aisle and collect them. So please get your questions ready. Our last question, uh, just from uh, a series of questions, what is the one thing that you hope the audience will take away from this discussion and from the exhibition? Well, if, if I can start off going back this way, my one thing that I would hope is that I think in, in, in Martin's great speech in 1963, and he said, um, the I Have a Dream speech, he said, this is not the ending, but the beginning. It, it's a continuum. You know, uh, I talked about, I was very fortunate in, in growing up with a mother and a father and my um, paternal and maternal grandparents were around. So the things I've been able to accomplish is because I stood on their shoulders. Mm -hmm. They made it possible for me. I've got some children and grandchildren and great grandchildren coming behind me. And we have to understand that it's a continuum. We've got to pass the baton on. Another quote by Martin used to say, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And you have to believe in that. And as a freedom fighter, there's no retirement. Right. You either win or you die. <laughs> Reverend Allen? I would hope the audience would uh, take away the fact that racism exists, uh, discrimination exists, mm -hmm. black people being the, the last hide and the first fired still exists. And until these things are eradicated, we are still going to be a part. But beginning with this group here tonight, we can make Columbus a better place, mm -hmm. a much better place by, by getting involved in dialogue to, to, and to discover what we can do, not only as individuals, but as, as a city, what we can do to eradicate uh, these kinds of things here in Columbus, Georgia. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the audience will take with them the insight that you've received today, the knowledge, and uh, an appreciation for what the museum truly has done unbelievable work, and the board members. I hope we take away that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ditto to that, too, Ethel. Uh, I, I look out at the audience, and I see a lot of people that I called friends and uh and they're a mixture of races uh, and that's in this year 2022 that we can look out and say that so i know that the majority of the people here are here because you had an interest a lot of you know some of the history i think you may have learned some more tonight i'm not sure listening to the talk we we sit around the table when we're getting ready to come and go out. That that's when you need to be sitting and listening to some of the, the background and some of the stories we tell. But I'm happy to be home in Columbus. Happy to have you. I'm happy that this is a community that welcomed our family. I'm happy that I had an opportunity, those segregated, to go to Spencer High School. I had wonderful teachers who molded me. I had a wonderful family that molded me. I think that that's what Columbus is known for in a way. When you look around at families, we, 
you always hear people talking about families. I appreciate y'all coming tonight. Uh, I know we, uh, we're stand, sitting up here and we try to answer these questions. They're difficult questions. I can't wait to hear what you're going to ask of us because I know the support of what we have talked about it in terms of history and what we really hope and dream for in Columbus is with people like you. Thanks for coming. Thank you, thank you. Mm. Wow. Since you can pass them towards the aisle down your row, and my colleagues will come by and pick them up, and we'll bring them up to Rashida. We just wanted to give them some to get us started. So thank you all. Always read over it first. <laughs> <laughs> we we suggested you know that she do that. <laughs> You're, I think you know why. All right. Okay, so the first question comes, and, and no name. We don't want to know your name. Thank you for not putting your name on your question. Um, today we are seeing there are too many people that have the same superior or inferior mindset and attitudes that we know was there over 100 years ago. We can't measure the damage that has been done and is still being done because of racism and bigotry. How do we create a more equitable culture today? That's one question. The last 50 years seems like we have been wondering through a, ki wondering through a kind of spiritual wilderness. Do you think we will ever make it to MLK Jr., the promised land? Is that a clear, clear question? <laughs> okay. Can I just come in on that? Mm -hmm. I wrote a poem, and I know I don't have time to read it all, but it was entitled Black Woman Mad. And at the end of it, it says that you've been through so much, but God can take a madness and turn it into a gladness, and only he can perform the operation that you need and set you free. That some things are so deep that you nor the psychiatrist can reach. The only doctor for the case, Sister Girl, is Jesus Christ the Savior. Oh, Sister Girl, you're mad. <laughs> Anyone else? I, 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 I'm not sure I understand the question, but I think what I, what I was trying to say earlier is that what, what's critically important is for us to be able to talk to each other, to That's have dialogue. Right. Right. And, 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 and what's important, guys, is dialogue is not debate. Right. It's being able to have a safe place where people who are different can meet and have a discussion, not trying to convert each other or right. score points, but to understand each other. And I think that's, and we've got to do that with, with adults, and we have to also do that with uh, children. We've talk, we got to talk about, you know, how do we continue community building? I was glad that the mayor is here tonight, and, and I'm hoping I had heard some things from Karen Brannon that, that you guys were doing something that, to help put dialogue groups together, and I think hopefully that will, in, you know, increase so that people can get to know each other. I think that's very important. And then it's, it's hard to hurt and to uh, be hurtful to a person who you, you get to know. I was the first chairman, she mentioned in my bio, I was the first chairman of a group called the National Conference of Christians and Jews. I was the first Muslim to ever serve as chair. And when I joined, they referred to me as the black Muslim. But over time, I moved from being the black Muslim to being Ibrahim. You know, they, they got to know me. Many people did, did, didn't know a Muslim, and many people thought that, that there was some requirement in America that you must be a Christian. That's not a requirement. You know, read the Constitution, read the First Amendment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, so the last part of the question was, do you think we will ever make it to the promised land? All of us won't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Be difficult. Um, here's a question from a difficult. student at CSU. It says, we have a large activist movement uh, at CSU called the Revolution Pro-Self? Is that? 
Project. 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 I'm sorry. Okay. The Revolution Project. Uh, they want to know if they can talk to one of you about how to be even more effective. Sure. The, uh, I don't know. You know, we, we've. Uh, I mean, I'm open for yeah. discussion. Yeah. We, 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 <laughs> We had our, our conversations, for those you may not know, we had a uh, Zoom meeting with about 500 high school students this morning. Mm -hmm. And so w we're interested in talking to anybody, and I think I was very happy that we do that. So uh, Lucy and Rebecca, the people here have our contact information, so we're happy. I, in fact, I, I had hoped at some point in time we could have a Zoom with some college students. Is, is Gary here tonight? The, uh, 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 Columbus. With, from Columbus State? State. Yeah. Oh, well, any college student. <laughs> but Gary was very helpful with us mm -hmm. on the advisory committee and the, and, and the Zoom. And so I have a special connection because my family can tell you uh, my maternal grandparents, Daisy and Charlotte Dotson, where they live was near where Columbus College is today. Right, Gwen? Okay. You know, it's interesting uh, that you say that, Abram, uh, just talking about the fact that where, who, where, where something is. I'm in California now, and whenever we go somewhere and we're introduced in a meeting, uh, natives come up and express that we're having this meeting on their ancestors' land. Mm -hmm. They mention who the ancestors are and what they were. So that's all over Columbus also. And I think a lot of us know that uh, uh, the, the history of the land here. Mm -hmm. And it does tell another story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just for the record, I remember when the city limit sign for Columbus sat at Rigdon Road and Macon Road. Mm -hmm. Rick, <laughs> that was the city limit, right? right. You, when you got past there, you were out, out of town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Vernon Mitchell was a man who, from my understanding, uh, started the Columbus Times newspaper and he did other things. The question is, what role did Mr. Verna Mitchell play in integration? Do you remember him? Oh, yes. Oh, very mm -hmm. much so. Please mm -hmm. give a little bit about that. He was very outspoken. And uh, we got a lot of things through his writings in the newspaper. Uh, Mr. Duval used to say, they used to say, if you want to keep something from a Negro, put it in a book. And uh, but he was, I knew him as a teacher at Marshall Elementary, Spencer Junior High, before mm -hmm. he had begun m married to, um, what's her name? Miss Ophelia? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was quite a leader and very outspoken, too. Okay. Yeah. I, I remember, I, did, I didn't know Mr. Mitchell personally, but I remember the Columbus Times in, yeah. uh, in the newspaper and how valuable they were. And it, for some reason in my head, uh, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, I was part of the Youth Council of NAACP, mm -hmm. and we had a riff with the adult chapter. We, you know, I think we were a little more militant, mm -hmm. and uh, I remember the Columbus Times supported us. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that was very hurtful to me uh, when we were having our protests at the Bradley Library is that in the daily newspaper, I think called the Columbus Inquirer, they mm -hmm. took out a full-page ad that says 40 Negro ministers condemn demonstrations at the library, saying that they are unnecessary and untimely. And I'm like, what's up with this? But the Columbus Times supported us, you know. Mm -hmm. Great. Another question. What do you remember about the implementation of the de desegregation of schools and other facilities? And what events eventually led those changes? And see read some of the again. younger folks. Yeah, I was gone. Yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, read that again. <laughs> what do you remember about, about the, the implementation the of the desegregation of schools and other facilities, and what events eventually led those changes? See, we graduated. I graduated from Spencer High in '59, and you graduated when, Rudy? 54. 54. Yeah. And so that wasn't a period. I think uh, they had just begun one year or two years of, uh, was it uh, Hardaway High School? That started with one year. And well, actually. Who was it? No, actually. What was it? A, a Carver? Carver? No? No. In 1965, uh -huh. our, our senior year, 
the school system decided to send one black oh, yeah. student to Baker, and his name was uh, Leonard. I can't call his first name. Robert. 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 Mm -hmm. And they sent a white student to Spencer. Yeah. Okay. But they were 12th grade students. It didn't start on the lower level that year. So in 66, I was gone, so I don't know yeah, if they continued. Yeah, and I was gone. I don't but, think but you that have worked. A, uh, you have a Baker student here today. Jean Hall is there. She, she integrated Baker. Stand up, Jean. <laughs> there you go. Yes, uh-huh, right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ah. Right. That's what I remember. Mm -hmm. When I had been brought up by an all black neighborhood, all black church, and all black school, and all black friends. And then all of a sudden, when I was supposed to follow, and I thought go to Spencer High School to graduate, my father, who was a World War II Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right, that's what I was going to bring up. That's what you were going to talk about. Choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And basically, uh, students whose parents had something to lose were accepted. My mother was a school teacher, my father was a postman. And so they had to get in the game because there was the concern about loss. 
our jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, okay, so I need to say this. It is not our plan for the audience to stand and speak because the camera is not on you and neither is the microphone. So the people that are watching us on Zoom may or may not have heard you. So I, wa I won't be able to allow anyone else to stand uh, as from the direction of the museum staff. I just want to explain why we, we can't do it that way. This I will time. Ask, I will ask the question. <laughs> Excuse me? I said this time. The next this time we'll have the mic to pass yes, around. We'll, That's it'll... worthwhile hearing. Mm -hmm. Right. Definitely but I so. just want to make that clear. Yeah. So our next question says, integration happened fairly peaceful in Columbus compared to many other southern cities. To what does the, do the members of the panel credit that? What you call peaceful? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because we had in, in, I think in terms of what happened in uh, 1963, I can't speak to the bus boycott, but during the, the, the Bradley Library situation, I think what happened, and I think one of the speakers who stood up in the audience mentioned it, uh, it was called Fort Benning. Right. And the, uh, we were in a, at a meeting after our campaign started, and one of the strategies was to meet with the commandant at Fort Benning and try and get them involved. And I believe there was a letter communicated to the city government that if they couldn't solve this situation, they were going to make Fort Benning off limits. And I don't really know but what hap what's the, the situation today, but in, in those days, uh, a big portion of the revenue for Columbus, Georgia, came from Fort Benning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Reverend Allen? Another thing was that, what the young lady mentioned, choice. And it was, it was difficult for some black families to decide to send their child to another, to, to a predominantly white school because they did not punish us transportation. They would bus us all over town to get to a, a, another black school, but they, wouldn't, they would not furnish black, uh, transportation under the choice uh, concept. My son, uh, my oldest son, went to Rockchild. It was Eastway Junior High at the time, and he was the only black over there. And the only reason he was over there because I signed him up over there and, and, and had to transport him every day. If I had had difficulty transporting him, he couldn't have gone there. And that was the nearest, nearest school to our house. Okay. Thank you. That was one of the hindrances. I would like to know your opinion on the effects of law enforcement, both positive and negative, on the movement. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I, How much time you got? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember any positive effects. I'm serious uh, from, from police. Not in Nashville, not in Columbus. Let, when let they me, got on the bus, they came there to arrest us. Uh -huh. yeah. Nobody said anything to anybody uh, except when the guy told me I was responsible for this mess. Uh -huh. uh, so... That, when, that was no protection from, from them. They, we could have been killed. They wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have made a move. When we marched with the black policemen, they had a spirit that was mean enough to scare bear. That's right. Yeah. Mr. Shue. Well, Sheeta, I, I've got to say, uh, again, this is, we, we could talk about this a lot, but I encourage those who haven't seen the exhibit to go and see it. Yeah. And the picture that I talked about earlier of the, the lynching in 1896 of uh, uh, Slayton and Miles, uh, somebody put on a postcard. These people oh, actually yeah. posed. Uh -huh. You know, this, this, these people's bodies have been riddled with bullets and left hanging there for days. Imagine that. Okay. Uh -huh. and, and two of the people, now you guys help me out, some of you historians, Gary is here from, is he still here from the uh, Columbus State? 
there were a couple of people in there who had police uniforms on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So part of the, the trauma and, 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 and issue with dealing with police is, is how many police acted and behaved. Uh, and I think that's what uh, I saw the, the news briefly tonight where people are on trial now for violating the civil rights of uh, George Floyd. You know, we, we still have those same kind of issues. Now, mm -hmm. I have to say, it, 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 there's some good police officers, yeah. but they have issues, you know. And, 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 and that's an area we ne really need a lot of um, dialogue on. My wife can tell you, I, yesterday on my way here, flying in from Atlanta and driving down, I got pulled over by the police mm -hmm. for some <laughs> simple thing that shouldn't have taken the time, but he asked to see my driver's license and uh, took us about 10 minutes as he called in. Fortunately, I'm a 74-year-old grandfather, and so I, I, I knew how to turn the gas down, but mm -hmm. I, I thought I was not fairly treated. Mm -hmm. Some of the black policemen, though, when uh, they couldn't be policemen nowhere but in our community. That's right. And some of them had some real mean spirits toward their yeah. people. I mean, the truth must be told. Uh, but uh, they couldn't go no further than 8th Street in and, and black communities. Yeah. That was it. Hmm. Black. No, I, I, had, I, I was uh, out of town. I was not in Columbus during this time. I do remember when uh, there was the incident of the police uh, 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 with uh, Mr. Leonard, uh, those things that were going on about the flag on the uniforms, that things became pretty, pretty hot around here. And, and I just remember listening to my dad and Mr. Chester and uh, uh, attorney uh, Albert Thompson discussing these things. I mean, these were things like Rudy would say they would get together and discuss some of it and plan some of it, but this was, this was a different kind of a thing. And um, the um, policeman was, sta was in my home uh, protecting my dad and mom. Uh, I don't know for how long, but I, when I came to visit, they were, it was very difficult to be in the bedroom and know that there was a policeman in the living room spending the night to protect my dad. Uh, so things, things happen to a lot of people and everybody has a story. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a story about something that has happened racially in their lives. And that's both white people and black people. Uh, talking about the, the book I was reading again discussing race and what happens because people try to deal with their understanding and their feelings of race is very difficult. It's very, very difficult. I would say too on uh, the, the other question, what do we credit uh, to the, the fact that integration happened fairly peacefully Oh yeah, that here. was the other part of the I remember the hearing about uh, lawyer Bobby Peters mm -hmm. and uh, Bobby Peters Cummings. and John Allen mm -hmm. opened the first interracial law firm. Right. And other people started doing things together. And I would think that that might have been a helpful way for it to not to be so agitated. Mm -hmm. You know, when people came together, the few that did. I think that made a difference. It made it easier for Columbus. So I just wanted to say that. Um, mm -hmm. But you were just talking about your book. A mm -hmm. question is, what or which current authors are you all reading currently? <laughs> oh, you want to talk about oh. the books. Abram has some wonderful books. Yeah, he did. Oh. I, I, Sylvia, uh, you, should, you should have heard him this morning talking to the students, and I'm hoping they had, that he got their ear yeah, talking about I, um, as I yeah. told you, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Viola Porter and Jake Porter would be proud, but, you know, I'm a lifelong learner, and yeah. I, I think I, there are a couple of things I wanted to share. I'll, I'll start off. Uh, first, I wanted to give a shout out to Karen Brannan, who's part of our advisory committee, and Karen's book, I don't, I'm not sure if it's in the uh, bookstore, the uh, gift shop. It's, it deals with uh, lynching here in Columbus, and she talks about her family and some family members who were involved. So I, I'm hoping that Karen's on the Zoom and she can do this. This one book I want is called The Making of a Black Scholar. It's by Dr. Horace Porter. 
who, had, who was a former chair of the Department of African American Studies and an uh, English professor at uh, Stanford and, at, and the Iowa University. This is a book called A Guide to the Powerless and Those Who Don't Know Their Own Power. I would like to read this because many people, where's uh, the NAAC people? This is wonderful, <laughs> young people. I work with a lot of people with the American <laughs> Youth Policy Forum. Many of you may, may know about this, but some may not. The book is called The Desegregation of Public Libraries in the Jim Crow South by Wayne Wiegan. We were here three years ago. We were honored with uh, Rebecca and her team to be a part of a program that was uh, talking about this book. And, and, and you, Rashida, at the, where's uh, Sylvia Bunn? Is she still here? Yeah, yeah. she's back. Yeah, we did uh, also uh, a talk at the Mildred Terry Library. But uh, Wayne Wiegan and his wife Shirley were very important in terms of putting this thing together. This is the book called The, the Book of Great American Documents. I'm shocked to find out how many adults, you're talking about young people, have not read the Constitution, have not read the Declaration of Independence. That was a requ requirement in, in social studies by Ethelyn Coburn at Spencer High School. This is a book called The Birth of the Bible by a good friend of mine, Reverend Willie Wilson, who talks about, because many of us were having trouble understanding how could people call themselves Jesus lovers, Christians, riding around with in God we trust on their tags and treating black people so bad. But he talked about the difference between what Jesus taught and what the church is doing. And the last, the other book that I'm reading is, and actually it belongs to my little sister, Gwendolyn Johnson, called Extraordinary Courage, My Life on the College Campus of uh, Columbus College, which later became Columbus State University. I would encourage you to look at these and, and uh, go to uh, people like Sylvia Bunn, and yeah. there's a wonderful library system here in Columbus now that you can, can take advantage of. And so, and, and, and for the, the young people who are in the audience, don't let adults tell you, you know, what to do. You know, uh, expand. <laughs> that did not come out right. <laughs> okay. don't, don't let them limit what you can do. I mean, if the teacher says, read these three books, the, the truth of the matter, guys, we're all laughing. But yeah. I've got children and grandchildren. They go to the internet anyway. So I'm saying you use your brain and the, uh, the, the technology for good and not just for frivolous things. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, Freedom uh, Emancipation by uh, Charles Wiggins. Once was the uh, head of black history at Indiana University. That is a very good one, too. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, thank you. And I, I love Who Moved My Cheese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's a good book. Who was that by? I don't even know. Oh, okay. They, they can Google it and find out. <laughs> ask, ask, ask somebody with one of those uh, cell phones. They can tell you in two minutes. In, two yeah, minutes. in a minute, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. There are several more, a few more. One is for you, Mayor Henderson. <laughs> I'm, it's got to be for you because it's talking about reparations, a fund established to eliminate black poverty. Uh, that's a question for the mayor, I think. Um, there are other questions, but this, this is my last question. I've been given my two-minute warning. Who were the allies from the white community? Mayor Allen. Mayor Allen. Mayor Mayor Allen. Allen. Uh -huh. That was a group during the uh, confrontation with the seven police officers. That was a group called the Ad Hoc Committee. Uh, from the NACP, there was A.J. McClung, there was Gordon Kitchen, there was George Ford, there was Margaret Belcher, and I um, can't think of her name. Uh, I was on it, Johnny Flace was on it, Sidney Ballard was on it, and believe it or not, Sherry Luck, who was a member of the Black Panther Party, was on it. Okay. Uh, Bill Turner, uh, Andy Speed, who was the Vice President uh, of Georgia Powell in charge of the Columbus District, uh, Frank Robinson, uh, Bud Ruffner. It was, but this group, this this really is the group that brought the Urban League here in town, and uh, and the reason we, we we brought the Urban League in town, several of us were saying were saying they aren't going to hire the policemen back. We had to face reality. But we were not going to leave here without getting something out of this, you know, this, this deal. And we worked together and, and did a lot of other things together. But they were, they were, 
this was this was talking. I mean, we were we were talking, getting angry with each other, and you know, accusing each other. One guy accused me of burning something. He said, he said, you must be the one that burning something. I said, no, I'm not burning anything. But if I see somebody with a match, I ain't gonna blow it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but that, that was a that was a, a real mm -hmm. good group in Columbus uh, at, during that time. I don't know mm -hmm. why. We... The in introduction of the Urban League, also the the juice of it, uh, started out of uh, Atlanta. Um, I was working at the Atlanta Urban League. Uh, so was uh, my husband, uh, to be Charles Clark. And, and, and we, Whitney Young was our leader at that time, someone out of Atlanta University. Everyone knows, uh, uh, should know some history about Whitney Young. You don't hear the name that often. Mm -hmm. But the Urban League became that other spike in the, in the wheels of the, of the bicycle. We had the NAACP and we had, what were the other groups cool. we were talking about? Cool. Uh, hmm? Did you have cool? Uh, yeah, cool. We yeah. had all of these groups, and the Ur uh, Urban League was that group that uh, wanted to get them to the table at the time all the arrests right. had started, and once you had the uh, attention of the uh, area you were trying to get uh, some changes made in. And so the Urban League wanted to sit there and talk about then, okay, once you've opened up and hired that one black person, they were all re only able to do that. Let's talk about employment. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there was a real uh, effort to work through Atlanta with the Atlanta Urban League, just starting out, and I moved there. What we came to Columbus with the idea, and it was Helen McClung who sat around the table with George Ford and my, and my dad talking about getting the Urban League here. And uh, George would be able to tell that story, but he's not here now. But the, the uh, introduction of the whole idea comes from a lot of different places. But we were coming out of, out of uh, Atlanta with the, the spoke of the idea. And let us remember Dr. Howard with Rainbow Push. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely so, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to wrap up our question and answer period. Is, is that the end? Let me introduce once again our panel. Brother oh, Ibrahim okay. Mookman out of Washington, D.C. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ethelyn Kirby, great motivational speaker. Lillian Bunky McClung. Yay. And Reverend Rudolph Allen. And I'm Rashida Ali. Two men, please, on 95.3 Smooth R&B, Monday through Fridays, 10 to 3. And I'm not a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> and to you. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Uh, Rudy. And thank you for this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, shoot. Okay. Mm -hmm.